Hey guys, welcome back. We officially finished our first unit, so I'm still, uh, it's going to take me some time to grade the free response part portion of your test, but thank you for everyone who's taken the test for me. I really appreciate that. Uh, I did get the multiple choice portion in, and I'll show you guys how you did uh, shortly. Uh, and we're moving on to our second unit, which is bivariate. I think, mo okay, all the stuff you're going to see on the ACT is going to be univariate data. So up to this point, now you know pretty well how to do everything on the ACT. And when you take the ACT, you'll probably know three to four, maybe even five questions on the ACT that have to do with statistics. And you should know exactly how to answer all those questions, which is pretty awesome. So you do have an advantage over all the other students that, in high school that have not taken statistics. They're just kind of leaning on their knowledge from what they learned about stats in their other previous classes, and maybe even some science classes, which is kind of sad. But anyway, uh, now we're going to move into bivariate data, which just means we have two variables that we're, uh, we're analyzing the relationship or the association between the two, uh, or even the correlation, which we'll get into a little bit uh, today and more tomorrow. Uh, and I think it's a much more interesting. We're going to be looking at the Kentucky Derby um, and the top speeds of horses uh, in the Kentucky Derby for the 100 and some odd years, 130 years that they've recorded data for. So this is the Mastery Connect data that we had for the multiple choice. Uh, section of the test. So on the very on the top, we have my on level uh, stat class sixth hour, and then uh, my AP stat class. So you can see, uh, of course, if we want to analyze it, just a general without showing you the actual data, um, which is nice about a box plot. It's just a summary of the data, the five number summary. Uh, you can see who what the minimum score was. That might have been you. <laughs> what was the maximum score? Was that you? I don't know. Uh, were you higher than the median score? Were you within the the median score? Uh, in the third quartile, somewhere in here, you don't know exactly what your percentile breakdown is, but you can you can figure out where you are on on the whole thing, which is kind of cool. Uh, you can also see how the data is. So it looks like for the on level stat data, um, a lot of you guys did really well, but the data was clearly skewed to the left because the left whisker is larger than the right whisker, and because the uh, the median is closer to the third quartile than it is the first quartile. Uh, but when we're dealing with Master Connect, or sorry, for the AP Stat class, it looks like it was more or less uh, actually skewed to the right by some people who scored really well, which is really good. Uh, but from the box plot, it looks like it was the middle interquartile range was uh, was was. Uh, roughly unimodal and symmetric. And then looking up here, it looks like there was more consistency in the interquartile range for the on-level on stat class than there was in the AP stat. There was much more variation. There were also, I have almost twice the number of students in the AP stat class, so that might uh, explain some of that as well. Okay, moving on. Cool stuff. All right, describing, um, so we're going to now deal with bivariate data. So bivariate data, instead of graphing one variable across the bottom, we're graphing two variables at the same time. So just like plotting a point where you have the x and the y axis, we now have an x and y axis for our two variables. Kind of like our contingency tables that we did for categorical data, where we were trying to see if you were first class, if you survived or died or whatever. But now we have two, or two quantitative variables, uh, like for instance, drop in feet and speed and miles per hour for roller coasters, I think it's excuse me, is that example, uh, interest rates and the total mortgages that they sell. Um, so as interest rates go up, they do less people buy fewer houses and shoe size and ACT scores, which is just kind of all over the place. And that's funny, but you know, anyway, so we have two quantitative variables and we want to look at the association uh, between the two. So or is there a positive association? Is there a negative association? Is there really no direction going on? That'll be the first way we can describe the association. So uh, it looks like as we increase the drop, so the, the total height, the drop of a roller coaster, you know, on the first drop, uh, as we increase the height, of course, the speed is going to go up. Uh, some of those are are even faster, even with a smaller drop. It's probably going to be like metal roller coasters, or it's just really there's a low coefficient of friction, you know, physics. Uh, some of those are very low uh, speeds for the drop that we would expect, meaning it's probably a wooden roller coaster, or it's old, or it's shaking a lot, and there's a lot of wasted energy. I don't know, but this is basically what we're measuring here is kind of. Uh, pretty strong because as we increase the potential energy, the kinetic energy is going to increase uh, and because of conservation of energy, and we do have some loss and some that are more efficient. It's really what's going on there. So this would be a positive association between the total height of the drop and the speed of the car. And then here we have interest rates. This would be a negative association, so they're inversely related. As we increase the rate of the interest rates to 14%, dang, that's really high. Uh, my interest rate was four and a quarter, by the way. Uh, three years ago when I bought my condo. Um, and the more total mortgages and millions are going to go down. So that's going to be a negative association. 
And then here, if we're graphing the shoe size and ACT scores as expected, there's not going to be an association between those. It's not negative or positive. So it would just be neither. Okay, um, another example of a scatter plot would be a time plot. So a time plot is going to have uh, some unit of time on the bottom, whether that's weeks, days, months, uh, seconds, days of the year, whatever. That's always going to go on the bottom. If you have any unit of time, it always is your explanatory variable that goes on the bottom. And we were graphing wind speeds as those change throughout the year. And these are the 360 daily, aver day daily averages. If we were describing the direction of this one, um, it doesn't necessarily have a direction, I would say. Uh, we might just generally, as we said, it kind of calmed down and then it gets even higher, but it's, you know, the, there's not like a clear direction. If we only graphed it out from this side here, then we could say it would be positive. If we only graph this part, we could say that was negative as well. So anyway, um, another thing we usually get into, I guess I'll go over that, is sinusoidal. So for graphing temperature, so temperature is going to be cold and it's going to get hot and then it's going to be cold again, and then it's going to start going back up, just like a sine wave. So like uh, y is equal to the sine of x. So that would be a sinusoidal. That's another one that, that could happen if we're graphing, uh, like if we graphed uh, the daily high temperatures or something like that throughout the year. Okay, describe association by direction, form, and strength. Uh, this is the form. That's kind of the sinusoidal was kind of a hint for the one of those. So this one is clearly linear. So the form is going to be like the general shape you have. So if it's linear, we call it linear. That's what this one is. This one is curved. You can call it curved, but it's better to call it exponential. Uh, now, keep in mind your exponential can be like a, a x squared curve. So like y is equal to x squared is what this one looks like or x to the third or whatever. I don't know. Uh, at least the first quadrant, but it also could be something that looks like this. It could be curving down and kind of tapering off and kind of uh, flattening out towards the top. And this would be like a square root curve. So uh, y is equal to the square root of x. It also could be an inverse. Uh, I guess I can graph an inverse for you real quick. So like if, uh, so basically y is equal to one over x. So as x increases, y decreases, and it would look something along the lines of that. So um, lots of different ways that you could have exponential curves. This one, you could call that a reciprocal curve or, or an inverse curve, just however you want to describe it. Sometimes they just call them all curved, but I prefer, you know, describe it if you, if you can better than that. Same thing with sinusoidal. That would be another one. It's kind of nice to know that one. Uh, and then over here, we have really no shape. So no pattern, no form. Okay, describe association by direction form and then strength. Okay, so this one is very strong because it's uh, they're all packed together, right? There's not a whole lot of variation. So as this is increasing, that one is uh, this one is decreasing. So this would be a strong um, strong linear association between the two. This one would be over here on the far side would be pretty weak. Uh, it looks almost entirely random. You could say there is still some association because there's no points in the lower end over here. You kind of see the gap there. So it does kind of follow a general trend. Also, there's not that many up in the corner. So it does kind of follow a general negative, uh, negative form. Uh, but it's not very strong, a uh, strong linear form. And this one, we would probably say moderate kind of in the, in the middle. All right, so when the association is linear, there's a special term that we can use and it's correlation. So we can still describe the strength of curved or exponential um, associations as being strong, moderate, weak, etc. Uh, but when it is linear, specifically linear, we can use the correlation. So correlation coefficient, which is just a, a lower uh, R, uh, under, uh, sorry, um, not capital, Lowercase, yeah, so lowercase r is a number that measures the strength and direction of a linear association, keyword linear association between two quantitative variables. That's also important. And so when we're graphing this out, it has to be quantitative variables. We can't graph uh, eye color and height, right? Because if we did eye color, what would we put as, this, as the one on the far left? Are we going like light to dark? And then you, that doesn't make any sense, right? The order wouldn't matter just like in a bar chart. Uh, we need it to be quantitative data, like in a histogram where they're all connecting and it's continuous in between the two. Okay, so um, it is important that it's two quantitative variables. Um, and on the very sm on this side over here, we go from negative one. Uh, so these are correlation coefficients R, okay? We're gonna be dealing a lot with that and more so tomorrow, we'll show you how we calculate it. 
but from negative one, that's the, the strongest possible negative correlation would be negative one. And then over on the far end, we have a positive one because it's a positive slope. So negative slope, positive slope. And then the middle would be zero. So it's going to be correlation coefficient is strictly between negative one and positive one. And these are just, they're not rules anywhere from like negative one to 0.85. We might consider that strong. Uh, strong linear uh, association or correlation anywhere from 0.85 to 0.5 is moderate and weak is somewhere in between there and at some point we would say there's just no evidence of an association uh, it's close to zero and again these are just kind of kind of trends that I've seen but it is uh, it's subjective to kind of your interpretation and so I there's you know I'm pretty flexible in grading it as long as I can understand what you're thinking all right, so conditions for the correlation. So in order for us to be able to calculate correlation, there's a few conditions that we have to check. First, we have to look for linearity. So we need to graph the association and make sure it actually is linear. Like over here, this is curved, so it's not appropriate to calculate the correlation coefficient. Uh, also look for outliers. If we have a single outlier, be called an influential or, or a, a leverage point, that can uh, change. The influential points can, of course, influence, that's what the word comes from, um, the correlation just from one outlier, just like a crazy outlier can dramatically increase the, the mean or the standard deviation, uh, depending on the direction. But anyway, and the same thing, it also has to be quantitative. So again, don't, don't graph um, anything based on favorite TV shows or whatever, or, or uh, eye color or, or favorite color or anything like that. Um, it has to be quantitative data. All right, so here, let's assume that those all fit. This would be a negative value. What would the correlation be? Well, it's not perfect, so it's not going to be negative 1, but it's going to be close. So maybe negative 0.95, I guess, and that should be a negative. So let me fix that real quick. Okay, so negative 0.95. And then over here, so this is not linear, right? So it's not appropriate to describe the strength of this association. This, is, this would be hyperbolic or um, an inverse parabola curve or something like that. Um, so it's not appropriate to calculate the correlation coefficient. And in fact, if we did calculate the correlation coefficient, we would get a value close to zero, if not zero. Um, so we'll talk about tomorrow how we calculate those. I guess I'll give you a, a hint. We actually calculate it based off of z-scores. Wow, that was terrible. How about that? So z-scores, and what ends up happening is um, the positive z-scores here, products of those, and the positive here, uh, these are going to be negative and these are going to be negative as well. So the positive and negative are going to end up canceling each other out and these are going to end up canceling each other out. And so we're going to end up with a correlation coefficient of about one. But if we do from the mean mean point, again, I know I said I was going to do it tomorrow. These would be negative values and these would be negative values if we're multiplying the products of the z scores um, because these are negative and positive and these are going to be uh, positive and negative if you think about it. Um, anyway, so we'll get into that more tomorrow. And so all those are going to add up. They're all going to be negative, and that's what's going to make it close to a negative value. Okay. All right, so what's the correlation coefficient of these? We're just estimating. So this one's going to be negative, very strong, so like 0.95. I think we said that. So this one's actually negative 0.977. This one looks like it's, a, it's still negative. It's going to be not as strong as this one, so maybe negative 0.8. Oh, apparently that's negative 0.923. Okay, so that one's actually fairly strong, I guess. And then over here, this one's also negative, but very weak. So maybe negative 0.4. Ah, 0.48. Okay, so you can see how good I am at, at estimating these, but it's just kind of fun. All right, so we can also compare height versus weight. So here on the bottom, we have height, and over here, we have weight. So we have our two variables. We want to see what's the association between height and weight. So one thing we need to think about now is which one is our explanatory variable and which one is our response variable. We're going to be using this language, especially response variable, a lot in statistics. Okay, So the explanatory variable is the variable that explains our response variable that responds to the explanatory variable. So in other words, our explanatory variable is the independent variable and the response variable is dependent variable because it's depending on the explanatory variable that explains the response variable. So anyway, lots of ways of thinking about it. Uh, independent, dependent is probably how you, I, I remember hearing about that back in seventh grade and uh, seventh grade science class or whatever, but um, we're not going to use independent and dependent. We're going to use the language explanatory variable and response variable. So we need to ask ourselves, if we're looking at the association between height and weight, is your height determining your weight? Is, is it the association going in that direction? Or does your weight determine your height? 
So typically, as somebody gets taller, they also are going to be heavier, right? Even though they might have the same BMI, right? So it's not that your weight is going to determine your height, but rather your height determines your weight. So we would put the axes in this order. Now, it doesn't always, it's not always obvious the order that we do, but sometimes it is. And in this case, it kind of is. So we need to compare uh, height to, to the weight, okay? All right, so as we increase in height, we see there's a gradual increase in weight as well. Um, we do see some outliers uh, here. This one's kind of unexpected. So this person just weighed a lot more for their height. Uh, it's one way of thinking about it. Okay. All right. So let's look at that point. Now I kind of changed it. Now we're talking about age and height. So these are, I'm, I'm guessing, um, so teenage boys from 13 or 12 all the way up to 20 years old. Okay. Or 21, whoever that one is. All right, so as they age, generally their heights are going to increase. There's still variation as we go between each you know, age group, but in general, those groups are going to increase their height as, as males get taller uh, and as they, they mature. So in this case, if we look at this outlier here, uh, and again, also I will say, anytime we're dealing with time, that will always be your explanatory variable. It's just a hint, okay? Just like a time plot, um, which this is actually a form of a time plot, I suppose. Um, we are going to always put age as our explanatory variable. And as time goes on from the beginning to the end or whatever, the other thing is what we're graphing is responding to the change in time. Okay, so just a, a general thing. And that includes age. So as they age, then generally tend to increase. This one would be uh, really high. So this student here, or this this child, on um, 17 and a half, so not a child, it's a young adult, um, is going to be is he is he tall for his age or is he young for his height so we're kind of thinking it from two directions so for his age what we would expect would be something around uh 70 inches which would be um let's see six foot ten so or five foot ten so we'd expect about five foot ten but he's actually let's see 72 would be six foot so he's about six foot three so he's he's much higher than we would expect right but is he tall for his age or is he young for his height so tall for his age would be looking from this direction which is correct so from his age we would expect this but he's actually taller than that but young for his height would be if we were looking at how does the age respond to the height so that would be if we switch the order of these two so that is not how we would look at it we would we would look at it for tall for his age and that was a little confusing it's okay so let's do another example. So let's see, how do ACT scores change over time? So when people first take ACT scores, their sophomore year or something like that, all the way through the senior year, what generally tends to happen to their ACT scores? So again, we're dealing with time, so that's always going to be our explanatory variable. And the response variable is, is the score. So how does the score change over time? Okay. And what are we expecting? Well, we're expecting it to be positive, right? Hopefully your ACT scores are going up over time. Uh, it's probably linear, maybe, maybe even curve. Let's see what I decided. Yeah, okay. So, and it was fairly weak. Um, and if we're, if we're graphing one individual, then of course it would be stronger. But if we, we have more variation, if we have much more students taking the ACT, so it looks like somebody scored really high when they were young and then junior and senior year, they also still scored high. Uh, then there's going to be more general low scores, but even some low scores, even in senior year. So it just depends on, on the group you're talking about. All right, winning versus ticket sales. So this would be an idea. So if we had, let's say, a football season uh, from a, uh, and we wanted to look at the ticket sales. So how many tickets do we sell? And does winning, you know, more winning, winning more games or having a winning record, does that mean that we're going to sell more tickets? Well, probably, right? Uh, so the question is, are, is, is winning driving sales or is sales driving winning? Hmm. And actually, if you think about it, it might go both ways because if you have more fans in the crowd, you might feel like you have more support and you might win more. Or is it because you win more that you have? I know, isn't it? Like it's all backwards. So I think the one that's more natural would be to see how does sales respond to uh, something that we can control more or hopefully we control, which is doing well. So unfortunately, uh, sales for down in Norman are going to be down this week. <laughs> 
because of that terrible loss. So anyway, we would expect this to be positive as well. As we win more games, we're going to have more sales. Uh, apparently, I thought this one was kind of curved. Uh, I thought maybe at the beginning it would make a big deal, but after after a while, you're kind of maxing out the people that would want to come would, are going to come anyway, and so it's going to kind of taper off towards the end. That's kind of how I interpreted that, but this is not based on any data. It's just based on what I thought would happen. All right, so um, we want to graph what does it look like to have little or no association, so weak or or no evidence of an association, so that's just going to be kind of random all over the place. Uh, moderate negative linear association so linear and it's going to be negative so it's going down and moderate so it's not going to be super tight together so it's going to look like that strong nonlinear association so if it's nonlinear and strong so it's going to be curved in some way um, and there's lots of different ways it could be curved I just described, decided to show it uh, curved I guess going up here uh, would be positive they didn't specify if it was positive or negative or anything all right cool so let's look at t-shirts at a store and the price and the number sold. So question we have is, so we're setting the price of t-shirts and then we're gonna record how many are sold based on that price. So kind of the way I set it up, you can obviously see, um, we're graphing, so the, our explanatory variable is price. So as we increase the price of the t-shirts, we wanna see how does that change the number of t-shirts that we sell. Clearly this one would be a negative direction because if we increase the price too much, people are no longer gonna buy our t-shirts even though we might make more profit. So you gotta find that sweet spot and that's what business is all about. All right, so it's gonna be, that's what I was assuming. All right, so explanatory variable is price. The direction is going to be negative. The form is linear or possibly curved, just to, we don't really know. You know, I, it can go both ways in a lot, of, a lot of things unless we actually see the data, just make a case for what you think. And then the strength would be moderate. So add an elementary, uh, elementary students, uh, all elementary students, their weight and their scores on the reading test. So do you want to see how their, um, their scores on the reading test impacts their weight? Or how does weight impact the scores on the reading test? Well, um, I want to see their response variable is the scores and the explanatory is the weight. So as the students get heavier, how does that impact the reading scores? And this might sound silly, but uh, this, is, this is actually a good example. Um, so our explanatory variable would be our weight. The direction would be positive. Form might possibly be curved or exponential, however you want to say it. Um, and then the strength is going to be moderate, uh, moderate to strong, however you want to describe it. So the real thing we're measuring here, and you can, I didn't do a very good job of hiding it, but there's something we would call a lurking variable. So as students get heavier, and especially if we're talking elementary, right? So you typically learn to read, you start putting words together in second, and then third grade, you're supposed to be able to read. Um, but, but anyway, so their reading scores at the very beginning, and especially as they're, they're growing and maturing as well. So our heavier, our heavier elementary students are going to be, of course, our, 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 our upper classmen, and then the kindergarten and stuff are going to be really lightweight, right? So as the lighter ones, their reading scores are going to be pretty bad, but then we're going to get, it's going to spread out and have more variation, of course, as we increase in weight, because what we're really measuring is a lurking variable, which is age. So we're really not looking, it's not weight that's driving up scores, it's actually their age and just the maturity of the student and more experience and being taught how to read. So anyway, this is what we would call a lurking variable. Uh, and we gotta be careful because there might be an association between weight and scores, but it doesn't mean that it's a causal relationship between the two. So correlation does not equal causation. You've probably heard that. If you haven't, you're gonna hear it a million times in this course, uh, especially our next unit. Uh, so correlation is not equal causation. In order to prove a causal relationship, we have to have randomly assigned treatment groups in a carefully designed experiment. So of course, we're gonna talk about that a lot in our unit, our third unit. So anyway, this is an example of a lurking variable. There are lots of other funny examples of lurking variables, but that's just one of them. Make sure that you understand. Uh, draw a scalar plot to represent this. So negative and really strong and apparently uh, linear. So it looks like that. This is positive, moderate strength. So something like that. And then this is almost zero, so it's just random all over the place. All right, so now we're on the assignment, so not too long, especially for introducing a new topic. Uh, so we're looking at apples. We want to uh, graph the weight in grams and the weight in ounces of apples. So if we think about this one, this one actually is pretty special because as the weight 
in grams increases, so does the weight in ounces increase as well. And they're going to increase at a direct relationship, right? And it's just going to be your conversion factor. That's just all you're doing is multiplying by conversion factor. So there's a direct relationship and a very, very strong. In fact, it's actually a perfect relationship between the two. So if we graph this out, it would look oh, this is just very aesthetically pleasing. It would look something along the lines of that because we as we increase the weight in grams, the weight in ounces is going to increase completely like perfect linear uh, association between the two because we're actually measuring the same thing. We're measuring weight, we're just using two different ounces or two different units. So same thing if you graph uh, weight in kilograms and weight in pounds uh, for humans or something like that, th you would get the exact same thing, okay? Because we're measuring the same thing and this is not actually that enlightening. <laughs> um, it's just kind of silly. And again, in this case, it wouldn't matter. Like if we switch the order, does ounces impact grams or does grams impact ounces? They're exactly the same thing. So it's an improper subset, however you want to look at it. Explanatory variable on this one, really, it could be either one. The direction is going to be clearly positive. The form is linear and the strength, I went as far as saying it's perfect because it literally is perfect. Correlation in this case would be one, positive one, exactly, not 0.999, no, it's exactly one, which never happens unless, well, unless you're measuring some observation of a natural law like gravity or something like that. So, and we'll actually look at a real world example where we do something like that. It's kind of cool when we re-express data. All right, one B, for each week, ice cream cone sales and air conditioning sales. Okay, so as uh, we want, we want to know, does ice cream drive an increase of air conditioning or is selling more air conditioning, more air conditioning, um, drive an increase in ice cream sales. Well, we know these are going to go together. Um, I'm going to go with ice cream and AC sales. Could you switch them? That's a good question. Um, I think in this case you could switch them. Um, and if we think about this one, what's really going on here is there's, there's actually definitely a lurking variable. When, when do you sell air conditioning units? We're going to sell air conditioning units when you're when it's hot outside. <laughs> when are you going to buy a lot of ice cream? When it's hot outside. So what we're really measuring is a lurking variable of temperature, really. So which one is more closely tied to temperature, the ice cream sales or AC? Now you might be able to say air conditioning sales because in the in the winter no one's buying air conditioning, uh, but uh, people do buy you know eggnog ice cream uh, and stuff like that in, in the winter time, right? So you're, you, it probably would make more sense, but you could do it either way on this one. Uh, it's which one's the explanatory variable. I don't think it matters as much. Uh, I thought that the shape might look something like that. Um, even though you would say the ice cream is to probably still going to be high because you're still going to sell off some ice cream when you sell no ACs. So anyway, the shape might actually be more curved. The direction is definitely going to be positive form. I said linear, but you could make a case for curved and the strength would be moderate. At least I'm assuming it's moderate. I don't really know. All right, number eight, Kentucky Derby 2011. So the fastest horses in Kentucky, the Kentucky, Kentucky Derby history was a secretariat, was secretariat in 1973. So 98 years after they started. The Sky plot shows the speed and miles per hour of the winning horses each year since 1975 when they started the Kentucky Derby. What do you see? So actually pretty interesting and kind of the general trend we see is curved and it's gonna kind of follow uh, a Y is equal to the square root of X curve which is kind of cool. So it's a square root curve and it, what it's doing is it's tapering off. And we actually see this uh, type of a curve uh, occurring a lot when it comes to sports. All right, so what do you see? So it looks to be moderate strength. Uh, it is tapering off or you can say following a square root curve, however you want to describe it. Um, it's a positive association. So as time went on, the horses got faster, at least the winning horses got faster. Um, in most sporting events, performances have improved and continue to improve, so surely we anticipate a positive direction. But what form, in this case, it is tapering off, kind of um, reaching a maximum even, maybe. Um, the maximum the one maximum one they said was secretary, which is 98 years past, so this point right here. And since then, there's not been a, a horse that's been as fast as that. So it's actually kind of tapered off. It's starting to go down. So. Um, potentially even could be going down. We don't really know uh, yet because that's extrapolating out in the future. All right, has the performance increased at the same rate in the last 130 years? Well, what's interesting about this one is if we break the graph down, um, the first part, if we just go to about right here, K 
okay, however many years it is. So the first 75 or 80 years, it actually looks pretty linear. And after that, it starts to taper off. So um, just however you want to describe it, but it's clearly not increasing at the same rate in the past 130 years. It's slowed down. All right, 13, this one was confusing last year. So I want to go ahead and get it started and show you how to do it, even though it's an odd problem. So ceramics factory can fire eight large batches of pottery each day. Sometimes a few of the pieces break in the process. In order to understand the problem better, the factory records a number of broken pieces in each batch for three days and creates a scatter plot shown. So here's the batch number. So first batch, second, third, all the way to the one that they do at the end of the day, which is the eighth batch. And these are the number of broken pieces that they have in each batch. So there's our explanatory variable and our response variable is the number of broken pieces. The response variable is what we're actually interested in. And the independent variable, the batch number is kind of not that exciting, but it's still important information. So we're seeing how does the batch number, as we keep uh, through to pumping out more and more batches of pottery, how does that affect the number of broken pieces that we have? And if we look at that scatter plot, you can see that it's a positive, um, looks like it might be linear, maybe curved, but positive, moderately strong uh, association between the batch number and the number of broken pieces. So as we create more and more batches of pottery, the rate for broken pieces or the number of broken pieces is going up. So that kind of gives us an idea of what's going on, at least uh, all across time. All right, so make a histogram uh, showing the distribution of the number of broken pieces for the 24 batches of pottery examined. So number of broken pieces, and then this is going to be our frequency. So how many times do we have zero broken pieces? So that's going to be all four of these dots here. And if you see the dots side by side, that's so you can see there's two of them, but it's really the intersection of those two. So it looks like here we have four. So for the first one from zero to one, but not including one. Ooh. Yeah, zero to one, but not including one. That's going to be four. Okay, because one's technically a part of the next one, if you remember that. All right, how many times do we have one? So it looks like six, seven, so seven. So we can graph that one out. And then after that, you can do the rest. So it looks like this one has five. And then I'm just gonna kind of fill in the rest. So we got five, three, two, two, and one. Okay, so anyway, got that. Uh, what feature of the problem is more apparent in the histogram than the scatter plot? So looking at the histogram, we can actually see the shape of the distribution of the number of broken pieces. And if we wanted to describe the shape of the distribution, so which is what part B asks us to do, uh, it's clearly unimodal, right? So our most frequent um, mode in this case is going to be one. So most of the time we only have one broken um, pot ceramics piece. I don't know what they called it. In, in each batch, okay? Uh, it is skewed to the right, okay? Uh, so, yeah. So we can tell it's unimodal and skewed to the right. What feature is more apparent in the histogram than the scatter blocks? The fact that it's skewed to the right. We can't really see the skewedness if we put all these together. In fact, if I took this histogram and I, I you could graph it out like horizontally. So the longest one would be here. We graph out each one of these uh, kind of horizontally. Uh, that'd be cool if I did it, but anyway, you can see it here. I guess I could just show it to you real quick. Oops. I don't know what happened. Oh, it's probably because I did the animations. <laughs> oh no, it's disappeared. Oh my goodness. Okay, well, you know, it was there for a moment. What feature of the problem is more apparent in the histogram than in the scatter plot? All right, so we said this, the fact that it was skewed. What aspect of the company's problem is more apparent in the time, the scatter plot? So the scatter plot tells us kind of a time plot of as we do more and more batches, the number of broken pieces goes up. So we wouldn't be able to tell that information across two variables when we only looked at one variable. So a histogram only shows you one variable. The batch, uh, the scatter plot shows you the two variables and how they relate to each other. So well, that's the difference between two. Antidepressants. Study compare the effectiveness of several antidepressants by examining experiments in which they passed the FDA requirements. Each of those experiments compared the active drug to a placebo and inert pill uh, sometimes a sugar pill, sometimes it's uh, nothing because you don't even have the effects of sugar. Uh, and sometimes they actually give you like caffeine just so you feel there's some kind of effect, but it doesn't actually change whatever they're trying to do. All right, so they call it, um, some people are given the inert pill, okay? In each experiment, some patients treated with a placebo improved, even though there was no drug in it. Uh, this phenomenon is called a placebo effect. So what ends up happening is people, just the thought of receiving treatment makes them think that they are getting better, uh, that they are receiving treatment, and so they, they actually see improvement in their symptoms. Or even being a part of a group of people that are improving their overall 
that, that the whole group is improving, just being in that environment might also cause improvements. And it wasn't the drug doing it, it was just the environment. So that's why we give placebos and they call that the placebo effect. So patients' depression levels were valued on the Hamilton depression rating scale. I don't know what that is, but okay. It's like, I guess, one to, one to five, I guess, um, where large numbers indicate greater improvement. Okay. The uh, scatter plot shows compared mean improvement levels for each group and of given for the antidepressant and the placebos. Okay, so here we have the improvement for the people on placebos, and each point here is the average for that group. So that group had the placebo had an average of one, and this one also had an average of one for the for the people who are given the drug. So in general, we can see that it's a positive trend. So as as the placebo improvement group increased, so did the drug improvement, but I would actually probably switch those. So as the 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 drugs became more effective and the overall groups were were doing better, the placebo group intended to do better as well. So you can see there's some sort of social social thing going on with the placebo, which is fascinating. All right, is it appropriate to calculate the correlation? So we have to check our three conditions. So is both of our data quantitative? Yes, so we're not dealing with eye color or favorite ice cream or anything like that. So it's definitely quantitative. Um, do we have any outliers? Nope, not that I can tell, so we're good. Uh, this value up here might kind of mess some things up a little bit because it's kind of off on its own, but it'll be okay. So no outliers, um, it's quantitative data, and it is linear. So you might be able to make the case that it does look a little bit curved to me, just depending if this value is actually true. Well, I kind of uh, accentuated it, but you get the idea. You might be able to make that case, but it's probably still okay to do uh, correlation. So if the correlation is 0.898, which tells us that it was pretty strong, or moderately strong, explain what we've learned about the results. So the results tell us that there is a positive correlation between the placebo group and the um, the antidepressant group. So the, the people that were given the actual antidepressants, as they increased, so did the placebo, even though there was no drug involved in the placebo, which is interesting. All right, number 30, cell phones and life expectancy. So as a warning, correlation is not equal causation. I don't know if you can read that. All right, survey of the world's nations in 2004 shows a strong positive correlation per, between percentages of the country using cell phones and life expectancies in years at birth. So does this mean that cell phones are good for your health? No, not necessarily. What might be explaining the strong correlation? So what lurking variable might account for, for the association between the two? I don't think cell phones are making people live longer. I don't know, maybe if you can call 911, you'll have to go to a pay phone, then you know, maybe that is part of it. But uh, that also could just be general improvements in healthcare. So why is healthcare better in countries that also have a higher percentage of cell phone usage? Hmm, what could an underlining lurking variable be? Could it be wealth? So maybe more wealthy countries that have more of a higher percentage of people using cell phones also have more people who watch, have TVs at home and also because more wealthy country have better healthcare, more, more access to healthcare or something. So uh, that would be an example of lurking variable that we're actually really measuring here. Just like ice cream and AC sales, there was a lurking variable of the temperature outside. All right, so I think that's it. Yes, that's it. I'm gonna stop talking because I've been talking way too much. But um, I'm happier today, even though we just did a problem about antidepressants, which is depressing. So I hope you guys are doing well mentally. Um, I, I miss having you guys in class. This is uh, my, my uncle is running a marathon this weekend, Memorial Marathon, and he's running it in a, um, he's running in a, a park in South Oklahoma. That's a, a mile and a half loop. So he's gonna be running a mile and a half loop um, 13 times or whatever it comes out to, to run a full marathon. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, that kind of explains what we're doing with teaching right now, because technically, yes, he's running a marathon. I mean, he's not doing it on a treadmill. That's even worse, but there's no like, yeah, congrats. Woo you did. There's no finish line experience or anything like that. So we're doing all the work. We have to do all the training and all the prep and stuff like that, but there's no enjoyment aspect where I don't get to see you guys learn and see that you it click and stuff. So like the most exciting thing is reading your test because I can tell you know what you're doing and like, oh, well, obviously something's working. So, uh, but the, it's nice to see those light bulbs go off and, you know, it just sucks. So <laughs> in general, um, I, I don't do my job just because I love math. I, I really do enjoy getting to know you guys and spending time with you. So that, that is definitely what this whole thing has taught me. So uh, <laughs> if you stayed around, you got that. If not, don't worry about it. See you guys later. Um, I fall break.